Yesterday morning, the prince came to see me. Incidentally, he talked me into moving to his dacha. I knew he would certainly insist on that, and I was sure he would blurt right out to me that it would be easier for me to die amongst people and trees, as he puts it. But this time, he did not say to die, but said it would be easier to live, which, however, makes almost no difference for me in my situation. I asked him what he meant by his incessant trees and why he was foisting these trees on me and was surprised to learn from him that I myself supposedly said the other evening that I had come to Pavlovsk to look at the trees for the last time. When I observed to him that it made no difference whether I died under the trees or looking out the window at my bricks, and that there was no point in making a fuss over two weeks, he agreed at once. But greenery and clean air, in his opinion, are bound to produce some physical change in me, and my agitation and my dreams will change, and perhaps become lighter. I again observed to him laughingly that he spoke like a materialist. He replied with his smile that he had always been a materialist. Since he never lies, these words must mean something. His smile is nice. I have looked at him more attentively now. I do not know whether I love him or not now. I have no time to bother with that now. My five-month hatred of him, it should be noted, it has begun to abate in the last month. Who knows? Maybe I went to Pavlovsk mainly to see him. But why did I leave my room then? A man condemned to death should not leave his corner. And if I had not taken a final decision now, but had decided, on the contrary, to wait till the last hour, then, of course, I would not have left my room for anything, and would not have accepted the suggestion of moving out to die in his pace in Pavlovsk. I had a nice little dream, of a kind, however, that I now have by the hundred. I fell asleep, an hour before he came, I think, and saw myself in a room, but not mine. But in this room, I noticed a terrible animal, a sort of monster. It resembled a scorpion, but it was not a scorpion. It was more vile and much more terrible. And precisely, it seemed, in that there are no such creatures in nature, and that it had come to me on purpose. I was afraid to lie down in bed, lest it crawl under the pillow. My mother and an acquaintance of hers came into the room. Here my mother opened the door and called Norma, our dog, an enormous Newfoundland, black and shaggy. She died some five years ago. Norma's gaze was terribly angry, though she was trembling all over. Suddenly, she slowly bared her terrible teeth, opened her entire red maw, took aim, readied herself, resolved, and suddenly seized the reptile with her teeth. The reptile must have made a strong movement to escape, because Norma caught it once more, this time in the air, twice got her whole mouth around it, still in the air, as if gulping it down. The shell cracked in her teeth. The animal's tail and legs got stuck out of her mouth, moving with terrible rapidity. Suddenly, Norma squealed pitifully. The reptile had managed, after all, to sting her on the tongue. Squealing and howling with pain, she opened her mouth and I saw that the bitten reptile was still stirring as it laid across her mouth, its half-crushed body oozing a large quantity of white juice onto her tongue, resembling the juice of a crushed black cockroach. Here I woke up, and the prince came. Here, the notion involuntarily occurs to you that if death is so terrible and the laws of nature are so powerful, how can they be overcome? How overcome them if they are not even defeated now by the one who defeated nature while he lived, whom nature obeyed, and who exclaimed, Lazarus, come forth, and the dead man came? Nature appears to the viewer of this painting in the shape of some enormous, implacable, and dumb beast, or to put it in more correctly, much more correctly, as strange though it is in the shape of some machine of the most modern construction. The people who surrounded the dead men, none of whom is in the painting, must have felt horrible anguish and confusion on that evening, which at once smashed all of their hopes and almost their beliefs. I do admit eternal life, and perhaps have always admitted it. 
Let consciousness be lit up by the will of a higher power. Let it look at the world and say, I am, and let the higher power suddenly decree in, in its annihilation. Because for some reason, or even without explaining for what reason, that is needed. Let it be so. I admit all of that. But again comes the eternal question. Why is my humility needed here? Isn't it possible simply to eat me without demanding that I praise that which has eaten me? Can it be that someone there will indeed be offended that I don't want to wait for two weeks? I don't believe it. And it would be much more likely to suppose that my insignificant life, the life of an atom, was simply needed for the fulfillment of some universal harmony as a whole. For some plus and minus, for some sort of contrast, and so on and so forth, just as daily sacrifice requires the lives of a multitude of beings without whose death the rest of the world could not stand. But so be it. I agree that it was quite impossible to arrange the world otherwise, that is, without the ceaseless devouring of each other. I even agree to admit that I understand nothing of this arrangement, but on the other hand, I know for certain, if I have once been given the consciousness that I am, what business is it of mine that the world has been arranged with mistakes and otherwise it cannot stand? Who's going to judge me after that? And for what? Say what you will, all this is impossible and unjust. Finally, there is the temptation. Nature has so greatly limited my activity by her three-week sentence that suicide may be the only thing I still have time to begin and end of my own will. So maybe I want to use that last opportunity of doing something. A protest is sometimes no small matter.